Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Tan Ong, and I'm filling in for Barbara Cochran. Uh, Dr. Cochran is actually sitting within the room, but she's uh, recovering from a cold. So she has a very hoarse voice. And so I am tasked with introducing myself and the other members of my panel as well. Before we start that, though, there's a couple of things that uh, Dr. Cochran asked me to highlight. Please fill out your profile forms. The slides will be posted um, at the end. And in addition, please hold your questions uh, if you should have any towards the end. And yes, and then someone will moderate and we'll be able to read that on the chat. So please feel free to go ahead and type in your questions at that point. So today, we will be talking about transitions of care. And you will not only hear me, but you will hear some of my colleagues that I work with as well. Um, and I will go ahead and introduce those individuals um, as well. So you have Allison Bull. Uh, Allison Bull is our primary care um, outreach at Aging and Disability Services, the area agency on aging for Seattle King County. She has over five years of professional experience in the aging network and an educational background in social work. Following her undergraduate education, she worked with older adults and families in post-acute care and hospice care settings. During her graduate studies at the University of Washington, Allison was trained to implement person-centered practices in aging and disability network through a New York Community Trust grant. She applied this training when she joined Aging and Disability Services in 2014. During her time there at ADS, she has coordinated projects to facilitate the successful expansion of information and assistance program. Allison's current role involves bridging geriatric healthcare and social service sectors through outreach, education, and training activities. The third person on our panel today is Melissa Enzi. Melissa Enzi is primary care outreach representing the area agency on aging and disabilities of Southwest Washington. So we have one individual representing King County and one individual representing Southwest Washington. Melissa received her Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies from the University of Washington and her Master's of Science in Education and Community Counseling and Student Affairs Leadership and Practice from Youngstown State University. Melissa has over 11 years of, of experience in health promotion and community mental health, family caregiver services, and care transition initiatives. So both of my colleagues, I definitely appreciate them driving up here and spending time here at the University of Washington and talking about this timely subject. And my name is Tan Ong. I am a physician who practices primary care and also consultative geriatrics in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington Division of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine, where I educate health professionals in the care of older adults. I went to St. Louis University, uh, did my uh, residency at the University of California at Davis, and completed my geriatric fellowship here at the University of Washington. I'm an awardee of HRSA grant for GACA, and I'm also practiced within a hospice setting as well. So. Um, I practice the entire continuum of care transition, so we'll be talking about that today. Okay, anything else to add, Barb? Perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, so we will go ahead and start today's discussion. We have no financial disclosures. And today, hopefully, we'll be hitting on these objectives by the end of the talk today. You'll be able to define what transitions of care and transitional care are. You'll be able to recall some etiologies for poor transitional care. Hopefully, by the end of this, this discussion, you'll be able to list components of effective transitional care and identify factors that may impair the execution of these instructions, uh, particularly related to patients and care caregivers executing those instructions. And
Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, all right. Awesome. All right. I think we have audio back. Uh, so my apologies for that. I, we were on the last bullet of the objectives. Um, and we will enlist community partnerships to improve the transitional care. And that's where Melissa and Allison will be coming up and talking about that last bullet as well. So we'll open this session actually using a case, an actual case that I saw in clinic. So Mr. HN is a 73-year-old community dwelling gentleman that I'm seeing with chronic medical conditions. And these chronic medical conditions are very common. And so you could see them there. Uh, they're abbreviated as a gentleman having diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, depression, and, and osteoarthritis. And he's actually being seen in clinic after he had a stay within the hospital for pneumonia. Fortunately, though, he is indoctrinated to in our clinic, and so he knows to bring in his medicine. So he brown bags his medicine. So he brings in a bottle of his aspirin, his metformin, and a thiazide, which is to treat his high blood pressure, and citalopram, which is to treat his depression, and acetaminophen that he takes as needed as well for his osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, the bottles of citalopram that he brings in, there's actually two bottles. And so one bottle is for 10 milligrams, and there's another bottle that was for 20 milligrams. And unfortunately, he's been taking both of these bottles. Uh, and so it turns out that in the, during his hospital stay, it was reduced from 20 to 10 milligrams. And the same thing about his lisinopril as well. So he was on lisinopril prior, and they reduced it from 20 to 10. And he brought in two bottles of the 10 milligrams of lisinopril and 20 milligrams of lisinopril. And he has been taking both at the same time. And so from a social history standpoint, he's married. And he lives with his old, oldest son to the care needs of his spouse. And that's related to his spouse having a stroke. But he actually manages, for the most part, his own medicines and has not had problems doing this before this hospital stay. He does not drink, he does not smoke, and there's no illicit drug use. At today's clinic visit, though, his blood pressure is still elevated despite taking both of those medicines. But he does report that he feels a little dizzy and clumsy. Um, and so what I had indicated there, that he's been taking both bottles of each medicine. And unfortunately, though, I think this scenario is very common for clinicians who practice out within the field that this is, is not uncommon, unfortunately, for when people discharge from the hospital and medication changes have occurred. And so I think that that's a great case to launch into the definition of what transition of care really means. And essentially what it means, it's the movement of patients from one healthcare practitioner or a setting to another as their condition and care needs change. And so it's simply that, is that the movement of one the patient themselves and their family and caregivers from one practitioner to a different setting. You can imagine that this happens at multiple different levels, though. For example, the most common thing that we talk about is from the hospital to the skilled nursing facility side, where I do a lot of my practice as well. But there's also then there's a transition that occurs from the nursing home, then eventually to a person going home. And then for the good majority of patients who don't need a nursing home. They go from hospital to home and back and forth between those two. And so those are the more familiar types of transitions of care that occur to patients and families. But there's also transitions of care that are within a localized setting. And for one of the prime examples of that is, for example, a person going from the intensive care unit that then goes to a general med surge bed, for example. And so there is um, a physical tr transition to a different floor, but there's also a physical transition to a different care team as, as well. And so that's even within the same care settings where there can be um, mistakes and errors that can occur. And there's another um, type of transition of care that we don't really talk about that, that most people might not be aware of, about, but I practice in the hospice setting where this transition of care is actually a, an administrative transition of care. And so it's across different health states. It's, for example, a person going from a curative state to a hospice care state. And so most people don't recognize this, but when you go from Medicare Part A, your regular Medicare Part A, to your um, hospice care 
benefit, you actually forego your regular Medicare Part A. And when you transition back to regular Medicare Part A, your durable medical equipment actually often will have to change. And that sets up a potential for errors to occur where you're not receiving the care that you need. And it's mainly due to an administrative tr transition of care. And so why does this matter? Because we know, and you know as well, that poor transitional care leads to very poor outcomes. And the majority of our data comes from Medicare, actually. So where nearly one in five patients are discharged from a hospital to home experience an adverse event within the three weeks after they're discharged from the hospital. And 20% of Medicare patients are readmitted within 30 days after they discharge to home as well. And equally as many SNF patients are readmitted to hospital within a 30 day of discharge from, from the hospital. And so these numbers I think are very unacceptable and just um, exemplify the poor transitional of care that many of our patients are receiving. So why, are, are, why is this occurring? Uh, well, there's a multitude of, of reasons, very similar to majority of geriatric issues is um, that there's multiple risk factors. One of those risk factors is related to the complex treatment regimens that older adults receive and just complex um, adults receive in, in general, is that it's very hard for individuals and caregivers to administer the treatment plans that are developed within the hospitalized setting. We have entire teams that administer these treatment plans and then we pass this off to the family member thinking that they could also carry this out and also the patient as well. There's poor, con there's poor continuity of care as well where that we aren't communicating this information to the next care provider at the next level such as a primary care provider. And there's another attribute to this is that there's a low level of patient activation and also engagement as, as well. And I hopefully I think that we'll be talking more about that um, in the later half of our talk. There's an inadequate transfer of information across settings where we have regulatory bodies and regulations that are set up where, for example, HIPAA um, pretends and limits the transfer of information uh, that can cause a barrier. There's also gaps in the services that patients may, may receive. For example, they might not be able to get into their primary care clinic appointment within that first three to five days, although it's indicated and so that sets up gaps in the services. And there's also the multiple health and social challenges that patients and family members also experience, that they have different priorities in terms of of trying to manage what their life looks like and maybe health falls below of their social challenges as well. There's inadequate preparation that we do within the hospitalized setting and also within the nursing home setting at times. And there's also a lack of standardized processes that we have as well that this is what all patients and families should receive by the time that they discharge. So one of the things that we did before was we defined what transitions of care is, but now the next part of this is to define what transitional care is. And transitional care is defined of it as a set of actions that are designed to ensure the coordination and continuity of healthcare as patients travel between different locations or different levels of care within the same location, kind of like what we were talking about within the ICU to the floor status, for example. And this transitional care should also be, be a comprehensive plan of care that sh could and should be available to all of the practitioners trained in chronic care and should contain current information about the patient's preferences, their goals, and their current clinical status as well. And it includes the logistical arrangements that we anticipate the patient and their family needing. It also outlines the education of the patient and the family caregiver. And it, it also, also um, involves care coordination with health professionals that are on the receiving end as well. So ideally, that's what transitional care should be. Okay. These are all the central components of what 
transitional care should look like. And later on, we'll talk about specific models. We'll be talking about the Coleman model. We'll be talking about the bridge model as well. Um, but these are all the essential components. By no means is this meant to be a comprehensive discussion about transitions of care and all the different models. But it's meant to be more applicable that things that you can improve within your, your own clinical practice and enlist community support as well. So these are some of the essential components is that all of the different models out there talk about having some sort of management plan trying to help and engage patients and their family members in terms of medication management and also the plan of care as well. There's some planning in terms of the transition and this goes in the preparation, working with patients and their families in terms of planning what that looks like. There's also a component of information transfer. This is what happened in the hospital or in point A. This is what we anticipate to happen once they leave point A. And that information should go to point B at that point as well. There's also an essential component of this care where there's established follow-up care. Ideally, that follow-up appointment is made before a person leaves. And so that would be the ideal state. There's also healthcare provider engagement as well. And this is related to the information transfer as, as well, that there's a healthcare provider from point A and point B, that there's engagement at both ends, that they are held accountable, which is the next slide, um, or the next bullet there, that um, these healthcare providers are held accountable and the organization is held accountable for that component of that patient's care. And lastly, that there is active patient and family engagement and education that is provided to them so that they can fully execute patient-centered care. Okay. There's a bunch of tools out there, but I'm gonna highlight one here, which is Project Boost. And this is from the Society of Hospital Medicine. And it's a screening tool that identifies what they call the eight P's. BOOS is, the acronym stands for Better Outcomes for Older Adults Through Safe Transitions. And they have a screening tool that's called, um, that they call this the eight P's. And it's just trying to identify the risk for having an adverse event after a person discharges from a hospitalized setting. So for example, there's problems with um, medications and then it outlines on to the right of that specific interventions to address those risk factors. There's a psychological risk factor as well. Then there's certain conditions that are high risk for having a re-emission or having a poor or adverse event after discharge. Then there's functional and physical limitations that a person can have or their family member could have. There is health literacy that we will highlight later on because I think that that's a very important part of engaging patients and their family members is that they have to understand what what type of language we're, we're using or the other alternative is that we change our language so that patients and their family members can understand what we're saying. There's also the patient support as well. Um, this talks about the social isolation and adherence to some of the medical treatment plans that we develop. It, then there's also risk factors for that they were in the hospital prior as well. And then the last P is for palliative care, um, identifying the goals of care and what the patient's preferences are as well, as that these are some of the risk factors that have been shown to contribute to adverse events after a person discharges from the hospital. And so um, it's a, a comprehensive tool that is to use for risk, risk, risk assessment. And within the program itself, there's a 72-hour follow-up call for high-risk <laughs> high patients. There's a patient-centered discharge process, a um, bunch of different tools that with, within the BOOST toolkit that involves um, a general assessment for preparedness. It's in capital letters just because it's a specific tool that they have. There's a universal patient checklist and making sure that um, the person who is responsible for discharging this patient um, goes through um, and also offering teach back as well. And there's also discharge forms and transfer tools to the next care setting as well, and follow-up appointments. And there's a standardized uh, primary care provider communication uh, tool that they provide within their toolkit. 
And so this is just a slide of what we just had talked about there. So on the top portion of this slide is the U universal patient discharge checklist. By no means am I going to go through each and single one of this, but it just shows you and identifies those um, things that are very common sense that to many people who are listening in. And, and the bottom part of this is a general assessment for preparedness as well. What? Oh. Oh, yeah, we good? Oh, all right. Sorry, everyone. We're experiencing some um, internet connections here. Um, so the audio went out. I think that the last part, and hopefully you heard that last, last part, was the universal patient discharge checklist. Um, the general assessment preparedness, which is the bottom half of this slide, is just an assessment of the patient in terms of their ability to understand information. What it highlights here and, and um, their preparedness for um, discharge. And so what it highlights is that there's certain tasks and certain risk factors that are assessed at the beginning, right at the time uh, that a person is admitted, and that's highlighted by the letter A there. There's things that can occur prior to discharge, and there's the D that is things that occur at the time of discharge. And so getting people prepared for that next care transition happens at the time of admission. It doesn't necessarily happen to have only at the time of discharge. And I think that that's what this tool nicely illustrates. Okay, This is just a standardized transition record. And so that's one of the barriers that we had identified before, is that this just gives the, the patient and their caregiver a standardized transition record that they can take with them. By no means is this the only one, but there are many tools um, that are out there in different models that use similar um, records and has similar information. Um, and then, then there's the transition. So what we've talked about mostly are transition for patients who are going from the hospitalized setting to the home setting. But there's also another transition that occurs from the SNF to home. And there's very little literature that is um, found upon this. But there is a consensus best practice recommendations for transitioning patients from a skilled nursing facility back to the primary care provider. And so what they identified here is that we that the primary care provider needs to be confirmed and updated. And so that that next step and that that transfer of information goes appropriately into the right recipient. And that a PCP should be um, scheduled within seven days after post discharge. And nowadays, because of the regulatory requirements within nursing homes, every single person who comes and gets admitted to a nursing home needs to have a discharge summary. Ideally, that discharge summary is completed
could you send a message to everyone that oh, we're going to have a two to three minute break? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, are we back? Good. Can they, well, can you hear me? Okay, I think we are back. All right. Uh, I'm trying to remember where we had left off. Okay. Yeah, we were talk, talking about sniff to transition to home and some best practices, and this was developed by by a consensus statement. Um, one of the other things too is that there's a verbal report that is given from the sniff nurse to the physician 
And ideally, this could be the physician or the care provider that uh, provided care for the patients within the nursing home that's trans and verbally transmitting that information to the accepting physician at the other end. And also highlighted here is also that, that the patient and their family member should get a phone call within the, that 48 hour following the SNF discharge. For many of those of you who practice within the outpatient clinic setting, this is embedded within the transitional care um, uh, module uh, for many Medicare patients. Okay. So there are many barriers to execute, executing the instructions that patients experience. One of those top things is health literacy is that the language that we're using might be too high of a level. Um, and so we need to use the appropriate language. The other portion of this is the uh, potential for cog impairment in many of our older adults. And then there's underlying motivation as well. And what we had talked about before is that one of the barriers is that maybe it's just not one of their priorities, that their health condition and their health status or their chronic care of their medical issues is lower on the priority with their social challenges that they have. And so that's where I think enlisting the help of our community partners is incredibly helpful. One of those topics that we'll talk about today, because I think that many of you on this lecture series have heard some of those issues with cog impairments, is that we're going to talk about health literacy a bit. Okay. Um, in a future slide. These are just different screening interventions, uh, screening and different interventions that are related to improving care transitions. And this was developed with assistance with Dr. Coleman, Eric Coleman within this field. There's a level one through three. And oftentimes when we talk about these models of the Naylor model, the bridge model, or um, the Coleman model and boost even, that's a level three, meaning that these are high systems where you identify really high risk patients and you're implementing these different models. There's a lot of stuff that happens earlier on level one and level two that occurs at the bedside, that occurs on that, that one to one interactions much, much more frequently. And that's where I think that I'm trying to make this um, presentation more applicable to those individual clinicians, which we'll talk about, uh, particularly related to health literacy. And as a geriatrician, you're probably wondering, well, why is Dr. Hong talking about health literacy, particularly as a geriatrician? And part of that is that there's yellow flags that overlap with individuals who have low health literacy and also cog impairment as well. So up here is a list of those yellow flag signs that have overlap with individuals who have cog impairments and also low health literacy. Oftentimes these individuals have come in with incomplete or inaccurate forms that, for example, when I'm seeing a, my initial patient encounter, we give them a packet of information that they need to complete before they get seen by the physician or the provider. And oftentimes they're inaccurate or they're incomplete. Another red or another yellow flag is that they're unable to give a coherent and sequential past history of what happened to them during their hospital stay, for example. There's frequent missed appointments that are highlighted, for example. And so you could see this is, could be related to people who have impairment in their memory, but it also could be related to people who have in, in low health literacy as well. And oftentimes the medications are in those uh, lists listed there are some of the signs and symptoms, symptoms of low health literacy, as well as people with cog impairment. Okay. And so I have a short video here that I think is incredibly helpful to watch. It's about six minutes, and this was developed by the American College of Physicians. And I'm going to ask, ask our audio TV people to help me set this up. I think it's incredibly enlightening and serves as a good launching pad to have some discussions.
doctor's appointments. I have to be sure that it doesn't interfere. Average Americans are struggling with modern health care. It's hard to be a patient these days. Average Americans are struggling with modern health care. It's hard to be a patient these days. What's it like to be a patient? What challenges do they face? I want you to meet some people. They'll show us just how complex and overwhelming health care can be. Well, I'm a kidney transplant. I've had the transplant for about 15 and a half years, but I've been sick forever. Okay, well, I take uh, baby aspirin, that's something new, cyclosporin, prednisone. And when I make the doctor's appointments, I have to be sure that it doesn't interfere with his doctor's appointments, my doctor's appointments, or their doctor's appointments. So you don't like to go to the hospital where they give you a lot of papers to fill Paper, out? Papers, paperwork to fill out. Paperwork. Yes. Why is that? Because I can't read that good. Because you can't read that well. What does it feel like when somebody hands you a lot of paperwork and you can't read? I feel like you're in another um, country. Vitamin D, Nexium, Norvasc, Cholested, Estratest. When you enter a doctor's office, the first thing, and you, your first time patient there, they're going to give you a clipboard. Sometimes that is very discouraging for a patient who cannot read. Lipitor, Paxil, Darvacet, Vitamin E. If I'm really embarrassed or confused or worried about things around me or worried about my child being all upset, I would not be able to read things I normally would read every day. You know, some of the words that uh, the Sanji, Graham, Plasti, and all of that, what, is that several things or one thing? or It's just a language that I'm not familiar with. If the patient was transferred to that facility and to any and all insurance companies or other third parties paying or obligated to pay, this is this is not making any sense. Tums, Tegretol, Tenormin, Sodium Bicarb, Cardera. Do you have any idea what a normal blood pressure is? No. Any idea? No. It's normal? No, it's not normal. It's high. Has, have you or anyone ever had to sign a consent form? Yes. I have hereby... I don't know. <laughs> okay. Authorized. Authorized. My calcium spray, Nystatin, Aricept, Lasix, Ambien, Imodium when you need it, and uh, vitamin D. I believe that's it. See, you know these people. And even though they represent all education and reading levels, they have one thing in common, low health literacy. It's so easy to make harmful and costly medical mistakes. Just listen to what they have to teach us. So what you do, you come out of that, uh, that, that room, that examination room with this intelligent woman or man thinking, God, I hope I don't make a mistake with my medicine because I did not understand anything he or she said to me. When your children have fever, what do you usually give them? Uh, Motrin mm -hmm. or Tylenol. Normally Motrin because that's what my doctor recommended. How old is your daughter? She is four. She's four. Okay. Yes. I would um, give her the um, four to five, a, ta a tablespoon and a half. So you give her a tablespoon and a half. Can you find where it tells you how many you take? The dosage? Three a day? Take three to two milliliters. And there's something I want to point out. I don't actually read this because I know what it says now. So if I had to sound it out, if it wasn't for I knew it, because I've heard it so many times, I would not be able to read that. Okay. Every three to four hours as needed for pain. Okay. What's a milliliter? I don't know.
the medication that was given to her was not explained. Well, we didn't use it. In fact, she ran out of her high blood pressure medicine, mm -hmm. so she didn't take it. She didn't call me to tell me to fill it. So finally I found out that she had not been taking it. I said, Mother, you can't do that. You have to keep taking that high blood pressure medicine. And then it says discontinue. Yes. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> How many times do you take these thyroid pills? Once a day. Okay. Do you take one of each of these? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you take two thyroid pills. No, I take one. Th I'm more like I got a messed up when I got refilled. And then, are these stickers helpful? Nope, don't no. even look at them. Don't even look at them. Okay. And what do you take that medicine for? I don't know what it's for. Okay. He just puts me on stuff and he tells what I have. I'll just take it. Low health literacy is catastrophic to patients, their families, and to our health care system. Millions of Americans struggle needlessly. Their misunderstanding leads to medical mistakes. These mistakes lead to hospitalizations that we could avoid. Simplifying material alone will not solve the problem. Funding is needed for health literacy research and demonstration projects to identify You can, can I go back to my screen? Are we good? All right, everyone. I think we are good, and I'm trying to advance the slide. Hold on. I swear that there's a gremlin inside this room, and we're having such major difficulties with this. I think that um, what I want you to take away from that video is the immensity of our problems. And I think this next slide will highlight that too. And it makes clinical medicine incredibly humbling. The other thing that that video, of what, what, there's a lot of things that you could take away from that video. But um, one thing that I would like you to take away from, from that video is that it highlighted people that I would not necessarily often think automatically that would have low health literacy. You cannot tell someone who has low health literacy without asking the appropriate questions. And so I practice at Harborview Medical Center where I see many non-English speaker speaking patients and family members. And so that in itself is one of those risk factors that then my radar is up. So I'm identifying and trying to identify the low health literacy. But every single individual in that video I would not automatically be able to identify unless you ask the appropriate questions related to that. Okay. So what this one study, this next slide is really interesting is that these researchers surveyed people within an outpatient clinic setting in three cities. One city was Shreveport, another one was in Jackson, uh, Michigan. And then I forget where the last city was off the top of my head, but they took individuals who were in the outpatient waiting rooms 
18 years and above in the waiting rooms of uh, family medicine or internal medicine uh, clinics. And they asked them, do you understand what take two tablets by mouth twice a day? And so they asked them that simple question. And after they said yes or no, I understand what that question is, they offered them a pill bottle with sugar pills in it. And they said, great, now demonstrate that for me. Show me what take two tablets by mouth twice a day meant. And, and show me by the number of pills. And one of the staggering things that it shows is that, that there was a decrease in the person's ability to demonstrate what take two tablets by mouth twice a day meant, what it's supposed to look like. And so they stratified individuals before they asked them these questions, they assessed what their health literacy was. So they categorized these individuals as low, marginal, or even adequate. What is really humbling to me is that even people who had adequate levels of health literacy, that they were able to say, yes, I understand, that there was a decrease in their ability to demonstrate that, which is fascinating and very humbling in terms of our practice. And so when we use the methods of teach back, what is that other than just simple recall? I taught this to you, I want you to regurgitate it back to me. But that by no means is related to the abilities to demonstrate those skills, which is a different skill set. So it is incredibly humbling. Uh, within this. There's a bunch of screening tools out there in terms of assessing people for health literacy. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them that I think that are incredibly useful from a clinical um, standpoint. So there's the realm short form and it's just a simple list of seven questions and then the instructions are this. Um, I want to hear you read as many words as you can from this list. Begin with the first word and read aloud. When you come to a word you cannot read, do the best you can or say blank and go on to the next word. And so it's not a matter of defining what the words are, it's just simply reading. Of course, this cannot be administered to an individual who is non-English speaking, um, but um, it's administered to only people who are able to, uh, to speak English. Um, and then they stratify it to individuals in terms of what their grade level equivalency is based upon the number of words that they can read from that list. And I think that this is a, a useful tool to use just because then you can also think about that patient education material that I'm handing to that patient. Do they actually understand that information? Because the majority of patient education material is written, written at a ninth grade level and we'll talk about some resources that are related to that. As well, and so this is what what I was uh, what alluding to is that the majority of patient education material is written at by on average at a ninth grade level, unless it comes from the American Medical Association or it comes from the National Institute of Health or the U.S. Department of Health Services. Then most of their material is vetted for a fourth to sixth grade level, but the majority of the other materials are in between a ninth grade to 14th grade level. And so that's why that realm short form trying to stratify patients to their reading level is helpful because of that. And so I actually did a simple exercise. These are instructions that I actually wrote out in my aftercare visit summary for a patient that I started on a new medicine. I simply stated you are being started on a new medication called metoprolol. This medication should be taken twice a day. This medication is for your high blood pressure. If you should have side effects of dizziness, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, please contact our clinic. That was just a simple message. And, and I went through this exercise where there's online uh, uh, applications that can measure the readability in the grade level. I took this and I plugged it in and this is at a ninth grade level. And so at least a ninth grade level is required to understand this material. And, from my perspective, it seems pretty basic, but it's still at a ninth grade level of understanding. Okay, And so this is just a slide indicating the different uh, patient education material that we frequently use from Micromedics to Medline Plus and EBSCO as well. And their reading level um, stratified from different readability indexes. Uh, and you could see that the majority of them range anywhere from a ninth grade to a um, 10th grade level. Okay, 
Another nice screening tool is the newest of vital sign, and, and this is a neat one where it requires individuals to be able to interpret a nutrition label. And so on one sheet, the patient is given the nutrition label. The next is a set of questions. For example, the first question is asked, if you eat the entire container, how many calories will you eat? So it requires simple ar arithmetic to be able to calculate that. And so then it also, depending on the number of correct responses, stratifies people for limited health literacy or adequate health literacy. So these are clinically use, useful tools. And for those individuals who practice within the VA uh, system, this was actually done by uh, Dr. Lisa Chu here at Harborview. And they screened and identified a single item that had good validity for identifying people with low health literacy. That question that was came out the strong the strongest and performed the best was how confident are you filling out forms by yourself? And it's it's that question that was able to identify individuals with low health literacy. Okay. Um, and there are other ones too, and this is an, a, a, a different one that is also stratified to a uh, different threshold. And so to ask, how often do you need to have someone help you when you read instructions, pamphlets, or other written material from your doctor or pharmacy? Uh, and so those are just some uh, clinically useful screening tools. And this is a table that outlines the ability and for us as providers and clinicians to improve the comprehension of our instructions. I'm not going to review all this in the interest of time, but just know that this will be posted on your slide set so that you can, can review. Okay? And there are barriers to screening, such as time and the perception of the lack of time. There's also a lack of understanding between of, from, of education for providers about how to screen these for low health literacy. And it's also the concern that by doing this that we're causing patient shame as well. And so for that discussion, oftentimes it revolves around me talking to the patients and the families that this is a way for me to better care for you. And I put the onus and the focus on me rather than the patient, saying that I want to make sure that I'm giving you instructions and I'm using language that you can understand as well. And um, so putting the onus on the provider and myself rather than the patient. And, and there's also uncertainty in who is responsible. Let's say that you identify someone with low health literacy. Now who's responsible for carrying out those things? So there's many barriers to screening, but I do encourage you to be able to do it. And so right now, in the, I'm going to invite Allison Bull to talk about community partnerships in terms of transition of care. All right, sounds like we have audio, and I appreciate the audience for bearing uh, with us. And there, there has to be some symbolism here uh, with some of the technical issues we've had in transitions of care. Um, but anything I can come up with at the moment would just be too cheesy, and anyone who's still with us will probably leave. Um, but thank you for that introduction, Dr. Ong. Um, and I'm Allison Bull. I'm here uh, representing the Area Agency on Aging for Seattle King County, but I would also uh, say that I'm here representing the perspective of all community-based organizations in transitions of care. And one thing uh, that I would say is true across community-based organizations and healthcare organizations is that we're all concerned with keeping people on track to do well in a transition to care. And I think we're all apt to feel just a little stretched beyond our usual scope of practice given the medical and social complexity of our patients in particular older patients um, and some of the demographic shifts and uh, longer lifespans that we're seeing. And so um, I do have to say that uh, part of my role is funded through the Northwest Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center, and it's a HRSA grant. And so in addition to kind of sharing about um, the perspective of a community-based organization, uh, we also, my, I'll invite my counterpart up here 
uh, briefly to talk about models of uh, partnering with community-based organizations to address some of the complex social needs and clinical needs uh, in transition to care and how community-based organizations can provide greater stability for some of those complexities. And I'm going to open uh, with a case example uh, that we have seen in the community. So this is a 62-year-old gentleman who was evicted from his apartment some months ago and has since been residing with his brother. Um, and the local fire department is called to respond to a fall and finds this gentleman on uh, the floor with severe weeping edema in his legs, so severe that there's puddles of fluid uh, in, in the carpet. He's sent to the ER due to the condition of his legs and then is uh, subsequently discharged to home with a new prescription for medication to address hypertension and an order for home health care. And some uh, aspects of this case that aren't immediately um, kind of evident in, you know, meeting this gentleman or working with him is that he's lost all his paperwork, belonging, and medications in his, in his eviction. So any connection that he had with any system, community-based organization, healthcare provider, uh, state provider of in-home care or transportation, uh, now kind of foiled with, with the eviction. So he's completely fallen off the radar. He has no vehicle, and the condition of his legs and feet makes it difficult for him to put on shoes and ambulate. So he's thus unable to pick up his new medications after discharge. And his brother's overwhelmed by cleaning up and caring for him. Um, he wouldn't see himself necessarily as a caregiver. He's just providing a place for his brother um, to live. And so he doesn't necessarily see himself in the role of helping to go pick up medications. And he, and this is true in many caregiving or family situations um, like this, has some health um, needs of, of his own. And the home health agency does not call to make an appointment. They only take a referral from a PCP, not the ER. So the, I believe this was a resident placing the order. Um, I'm not sure if this is common. I don't know enough about the situation. Uh, but they did not call to make an appointment. So in this case, um, you kind of start to see some of the common uh, root causes of ineffective transitions of care that Dr. Ong covered before. So we have kind of communication. So the home health agency isn't calling to make an appointment. They likely contacted uh, the resident who placed the order, but none of this information is, is fed back uh, to this gentleman, his family member, or anyone who's really able to navigate um, and reach him and follow up on this situation. We also see um, issues with patient and family engagement. So you know, his brother, while he lives with his brother, isn't necessarily in a position to uh, provide some of the care tasks and may not understand all that's um, involved in uh, kind of caring for his condition. And I would also say, in adding to this after listening to Dr. Ong's presentation, uh, kind of the motivation for this gentleman, um, you know, his fragile living situation means he's really concerned with, you know, kind of maintaining a good relationship with his brother and probably not being a burden to his brother. So he's, you know, their relationship is brotherly, not necessarily a caregiving relationship, as you would see maybe reading this case. And we also see uh, some of the uh, social determinants of health, uh, access to transportation um, and medication. So um, in addition to not being able to pick up his medications, probably not likely that he'll be able to follow up with primary care. And given that he's lost all his paperwork, primary care likely won't be able to be in touch with him. So I feel like this case kind of demonstrates many of the factors beyond clinical determinants that impact transitions care. So all your best efforts to rehabilitate this person and uh, consider what a transition home may look like are foiled by things that may seem kind of beyond your scope of practice. Some other uh, Non-clinical determinants include cognitive status, activity level, functional status, home environment. Um, in this case, we talked about availability of support from caregivers and family, ability to obtain medications and transportation. And I feel like these um, commonly present themselves in terms of cases that we see in the community and what are some of the drivers to uh, people going back either to the ER and then admitted to the hospital. And these factors, um, from our perspective, are likely to present themselves in transitions to home. 
So during that transition uh, to home, that's where all the confusion, lack of communication, uh, lack of coordination, uh, gaps in services, lack of access to services, that's where they all sort of uh, become very evident and quickly situations deteriorate and you'll see this person again. So these pictures, I wouldn't say, are common. Uh, there are certainly smooth transitions to home, but I share these just to present, you know, situations that we find ourselves walking into um, after a transition uh, from either SNF or hospital to home. Missing here are probably medication bottles uh, strewn on, on the table. And the one constant in these situations um, and the numerous interfaces that a transition of care can involve, the constant really is the patient, families, and caregivers, and indeed most transition plans assume that a reasonable amount of care will be provided by a family member. Uh, in a survey from AARP, nearly half of family caregivers are performing medical or nursing tasks for a loved one, uh, so managing medications. And I have a statistic here, uh, nearly half of the surveyed caregivers were administering five to nine medications a day. Providing wound care, which is one of the more challenging clinical uh, tasks that a caregiver can provide, uh, managing special diets, injections, and operating specialized medical equipment. And in addition to this, I didn't include this on the slide, but I want to mention the role of caregivers in coordinating care as well. So advocating on behalf of their family member across these really complex systems is just in addition to all of these medical and nursing tasks. And the best laid plans, we can probably make a joke here too with uh, the, some of the technical issues, and thank you to our IT folks here. Uh, most family caregivers do not receive training or have a perception, you know, that they really weren't involved in making decisions related to a discharge plan, and they feel like their preparation for the next stage of care is poor uh, consistently. Um, many don't receive home visits by healthcare professionals, so in addition to all of the tasks that they're providing, they feel pretty isolated and alone in doing those things. So there's a lack of feeling like they have control over their situation and their role. There's really no alternatives that they see to providing this care. And the cumulative impact of the stress and burden, uh, lack of control, um, guilt for feeling like maybe they do need support, and there are many other presentations I think this series has covered in the past about caregiver, caregiver identity, stress and burden. Many report feeling down, depressed, hopeless, and this contributes maybe to their intention to place an individual in a long-term care environment when otherwise the person may be able to remain home with some supports. And my colleague will talk a bit about some of the evidence-based practices and models that incorporate uh, community-based organizations but I want to kind of make sure that we cover things that you may, may be able to do in the next day, month, year. Um, so really to ask where in your processes you can identify and provide support and training for family caregivers um, as they need to understand how to perform these tasks. Also need to understand what the situation is going to look like when someone is home. So how has the baseline of functioning of the individual changed? And what does the disease trajectory look like? So how is their role as a family member going to change over time? And community-based organizations in this instance um, are, can be really helpful in terms of providing the actual support and training. So area agencies on aging provide caregiver support programs that give people access to training to help them feel more confident in their role, uh, can help provide access to equipment, support groups. There are also Alzheimer's associations, which many participate, I think, on these lectures and will tell you that they are really critical in consulting with people um, who are facing memory loss and making decisions about, you know, the, the future and advanced planning. And also, I would, I want to mention adult day care and adult day health settings, who in addition to providing support for your patients, uh, also provide respite for a caregiver as well. And so with that said, I want to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Melissa. All right. How's that? Am I good? 
Thank you, Allison and Dr. Ong. Um, as Allison said, looking for those community partnerships or ways that you can enhance the, the care plan or the work that you're trying to carry out from a clinical environment, linking that to the community environment where a lot of that care and where a lot of the work happens. And so um, AAAs, Area Agencies on Aging, and community-based organizations have been doing this work as foundationally. Our mission is to provide services and supports to allow people to age in the setting of their choice. And so we've gotten really good at addressing some of these social determinants of health, and we've been uh, looking for ways to, to bridge that clinical gap. And one of the ways that AAAs nationally have been doing that is by implementing some of these evidence-based models and evidence-based practices that we're going to get into a little bit deeper um, here moving forward. But I just want to, one point that came up while Dr. Ong was speaking and kind of a call to action of reaching out to a community-based organization or a AAA is that discharge planning begins at admission. And so by working with a community-based organization to implement one of these models in a more formal partnership, that can allow for some of the resources to start at the second that that patient's admitted. So where's the evidence and why are we talking about this? Um, if you were to Google care transitions, transitions of care, or do um, some sort of literature review, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of models. Some are more medically based, some are based on the type of setting, like skilled nursing facility to home or hospital to home. Others are very specific in um, the diagnoses that's being carried out. Some are very specific in terms of staffing that they need to be carried out by a nurse or by someone with a certain certification or degree. Others are more loose. So we're going to highlight two models that have been used by AAAs effectively. Um, the first of those is the Care Transitions Program, or known as the Care Transi Transitions Intervention, CTI, Skill Transfer Model, Coleman in Transitions Intervention Model, or the Coleman Model. I've heard them referred to it by all of these, and so I just say that so that we all know we're on the same page. And this program um, was developed out of UC Denver, and it's a four-week intervention. It was originally intended for people 65 and older, but it's been found to be effective for a broader age range. And it's a hospital-to-home intervention. So over those four weeks or 30 days, um, working with a community-dwelling older adult and their family with the goals that uh, rehospitalizations will be reduced, patient confidence will be increased, and that patient activation idea. So getting that patient to take a more active role in their care by using their patient-centered health record, coordinating follow-up, and promoting red flags knowledge. So those four pillars, medication self-management is a component of um, this model, so making sure that patients and their caregivers understand what the medications are, why they're taking them, and how to take them correctly. Using a personal health record, so tracking things like appointments, follow-up appointments, questions that you want to make sure that you're asking at that next appointment, and documenting that in one, one place that can come, go with you from visit to visit to visit. Timely primary care or specialty care follow-up, so making sure that appointments are happening in a timely manner, and then also knowledge of red flags indicating a worsening condition, um, and how to respond. So if a patient or their family member is noticing that they may be approaching a point where they need to take some action, what does that look like? So the intervention really looks, it's carried out by, an, originally it was a nurse, but then they have found that it can be, there can be training across different interdisciplinary teams. and. It starts with a hospital visit, so introducing themselves as, at bedside as that transitions coach. And then a home visit within 24 to 72 hours of discharge, where there will be that medication reconciliation, the red flag review, and also potentially role playing to help actively engage those patients. So let's talk about what is this going to look like, or how are we going to, let's role play, I'll be you, you be the doctor, or vice versa, and say, you want to ask that question or you want to share your concerns about wanting to stop a certain treatment or start a certain medication. And then there's three follow-up phone calls from there. So this model is widely used. Over 750 organizations in 40 states are using it and they show a 20 to 50 percent reduction in rehospitalizations if it's used to model fidelity. 
And their website is on here, this caretransitions.org, if you wanted more information. The other model that I'm going to cover today is called the Bridge Model. This was developed out of Rush University Medical Center. And this model touts itself as the social work model. So wanting to look at it from a person-centered perspective, the intervention is designed to be four weeks or 30 days. It was originally developed for individuals 60 and over, but it's been translatable to other age groups. Community dwelling individuals who are transferring from hospital to home. And they look for certain risk factors, such as individuals living alone, caregiver stress being identified in the hospital, or having a hospitalization in the last six months as being the best patients to work with for this intervention. Their goals are to reduce caregiver stress. So as Allison was sharing, um, marking that as one of the goals of the entire intervention through ensuring that they're a part of the process, um, increasing consumer safety, reducing ED visits and hospitalizations, increasing adherence to medical plans. So all those best laid plans we were talking about and all the work that's happening on the clinical side, making sure that it's being carried out in a thoughtful way. And then increasing older adult and caregiver satisfaction with their care. So um, the intervention carries out again with a hospital visit to start. And IDing those patients and meeting with them at the hospital to discuss potential uh, referrals to other community organizations. So before the patient gets home or before their discharge plan has even been fully carried out, looking for opportunities to start some wheels turning or start some processes, whether that's filling out paperwork, making a phone call, making doing a referral to Meals on Wheels so that that can be set up when the patient gets home. So that starts at that first hospital bedside visit. And then prote providing contact info and letting them know that you're going to be calling um, back once they discharge. And then post-discharge, the call takes place within 48 hours to assess, say, how's it going? Here's these resources we talked about, and then potentially schedule a home visit. And then relaying that critical information to healthcare providers as a part of the process. So each, each interaction with the patient also typically, mo this model states that that interaction should also then be relayed to the healthcare provider so that everyone's on the same page. And they found a 30% reduction in readmission over their 100 trained sites in the US and Canada. So it's not as highly studied or as highly used as the Kuhlman model, but it's shown to be effective um, as well. And their website, transitionalcare.org, is also on here if you wanted to look into it further. So we talk about a typical case, and this is this beautiful timeline of the way that things could go, that someone, we meet with them pre-discharge because we get a referral, we review their EMR, we do a bedside visit, and post-discharge, there's a phone call, a home visit, a med rec, all of these pieces. But really, there's no typical case when it comes to transitional care. And I would say that if we were to map out all of the interactions and all the phone calls, all the emails, all of the EMR reviews as time's going on, this would look much more like a spider web of lots of interactions going every which way. And that's where working with a community-based organization, we talk about like whose job is it with health literacy, whose job is it to assess that patient and figure out how to go forward by having a designated team or staff um, to be that point person, to, co to coordinate that care and to make sure that they're aware, oh, home health doesn't take referrals from the ER. So we're going to have to go back to your PCP and get that referral in because it's really important that we get that wound care in the home and we want to do that sooner. Or oh, no, you have to do this one more piece of paperwork or that Medicaid long-term care isn't going to start. And so being able to keep the wheels churning and communicating with all the invested parties is a really important piece of a typical case. That's the, the typical part is that there's a lot of communication that needs to happen. So in doing this work for a while, I get a lot of questions, but, but isn't this home health, right? You're going out, you're talking about someone's post-discharge. It's, it's kind of like home health, or aren't you guys working at cross purposes? And both focus on the needs of the patient and caregiver activation. But I would say that home health often has to be driven 
by the medical necessities. So the person has to qualify for home health. They have to meet a certain threshold, whereas community-based organizations have some more flexibility in how they work with patients. And it oftentimes can be extremely valuable and helpful to be working in collaboration. I can't tell you how many times we've had home health in place and they're able to really dive in and make sure that those medication needs or different components of their medical care are being cared for while we can keep things going and getting those social supports and addressing those social determinants of health. And also recognizing that not everyone qualifies for a social work visit through home health, for example. So some of those needs may not be properly addressed and that could be a missed opportunity. So there's definitely options to work together um, and in collaboration to meet those patient needs. The other question that I frequently get, but what about that follow-up phone call, right? From the clinic setting, whether that's from skilled nursing or that's from their primary care. And where I would say that community-based organizations and AAAs, we, we have a lot of, uh, we add a lot of value to this area because we're able to have eyes on the home. Like Alice, the picture that Allison showed, you never know what you don't know. And some of the things just may not come up as a part of a potential screening. So that phone call, yes, we want to make sure that they know when their doctor's appointment is. We want to make sure that they have the medications that they were supposed to have post-discharge, and we're constantly reinforcing that. But maybe it's not coming up when you ask at the hospital, so do you have access to food? Well, what does that mean? That might mean something really different to me or to someone else. A colleague of mine recently shared a story about yeah, and they said they had access to food, and their daughter was dropping off grapes. That was the only food that they had, and they were on a diabetic diet. So, they, yeah, they had access to food, but it wasn't necessarily fully encompassing or fully meeting their needs. And so I think that that face-to-face -face visit also is where the art and science of transitional care kind of come in, because so much of effective transitions has to do with communication and relationships. And for some of our patients, especially older patients, patients living with dementia and their caregivers, we want to make sure that they're hearing and having the messages reinforced. And so sometimes it's a matter of sitting next to someone and going through all that paperwork in a way that feels maybe slower or that is translatable to a different environment or that it's reinforcing something they may have heard three times, but it's that fourth time that, oh, okay, now I understand. Or helping them to write out those specific questions that they do have to make sure that they're getting addressed. So we love the follow-up phone call from our AAA side. We especially love to be able to reinforce it, but I think that there's so much value in meeting with someone's home, with someone in their home, seeing that rug that might have had something to do with that fall or seeing the pill bottles that are out over the counter that yes they have all the ones that were on their discharge plan but let's talk about this what's going on over here too in conclusion so we have time for some questions uh, the impact of poor transitional care is significant so that crosses age that crosses cognitive impairment whether someone has family caregiver or not, we want to make sure that we have effective transitional care so that all the hard work we're doing, whether it's on the clinical side or the community side, can really play out in a way that it positively impacts patient outcomes. We want to look for risk factors for adverse events after a transition, and that there are many interventions and models. We highlighted a couple uh, that are available to improve transitions of care. And again, that call to action to look for community partnerships, whether it's finding your local AAA, um, looking through the Alzheimer's Association, Adult Day Health, but finding that partner so that both parties' work can really work together to make sure patients are getting the care that they need. Now I think we'll turn it on for questions. Yes. So there's actually already a question that came up asking about that case with Charles. Would CPS be involved with Charles? to services, transitional care, Okay. 
So let me just hold this. Yes, so actually I considered kind of presenting on what the outcome of that case was because I'm sure people were curious and I think that this can highlight you know, one way um, that, you know, really partnering with community-based organizations, and not just as a vendor of services, but also really in a collaborative way, um, can impact some of the outcomes of these, ca these cases. So in this particular instance, this is a partnership we have across the fire department, our area agency on aging, and APS. So when the fire department made the referral to APS, we also were notified and could really be there at the home sooner than perhaps APS, um, and depending on the actual facts or specifics of the case, you know, they're pretty strapped for a time too. Um, they were involved. Um, so the role of our case manager then in partnership with APS was really making sure, you know, gathering all that paperwork and helping, you know, this gentleman apply um, for services or kind of just be re initiated into some services he had access to previously, including uh, some of the Medicaid brokerage services to appointments to help him apply and to um, gain access to in-home personal care pretty quickly um, while an application for state-funded uh, in-home care was pending. Uh, where APS really, I think, stepped in and assisted was in the care of uh, the brother as well. And it turns out there are other individuals involved who uh, you know, were really supposed to be there to help drop off groceries. Um, but you know, there was some groceries that seemed to be missing or, you know, uh, money that was unaccounted for. So they helped and assisted on kind of the financial exploitation uh, piece and consulted on that uh, while we worked with this person. So yes, it really isn't one agency kind of doing it all in isolation. I think this just goes to show that it's a, it's a whole system and everyone has kind of a role to play. Um, says that they have difficulty with patient engagement. What su suggestions do you have? I, I'm not sure of the model or what type of intervention that you're using, but that gets back to what I was saying about the relationship and the fact that discharge begins at admission. And so if there's a way to begin that patient activation in the hospital, whether that is getting them activated with wanting to connect with a transitional care coordinator outside the hospital setting. That's where that formal partnership can really be beneficial because it's nice to have someone who's a familiar face saying, I'm going to call you and schedule a home visit rather than just calling you and saying, I'd like to come to your house and I know you don't know me or how I've ever gotten your information. And so the relationship-based piece would be my biggest suggestion. To add to this too, I think when someone's in an inpatient setting or away from their home environment or where they currently were receiving care or in self-care, um, when they're not in that environment, their goal is to return home or to leave the hospital, leave the skilled nursing environment. That's their goal. That's what they're working towards. Once they return home, their goal suddenly changes or they just don't know what they should be working on next. So this is where, you know, that connection and following through and working with people in that next level of care or back to home I think is really critical because now their goals have changed and this is the opportunity that, you know, you can work on really kind of connecting those pieces, um, working on managing you know, that health condition for a longer period of time. And I would just add on top of that is is that I think that's spot on is that the initial goal was to get from point A to point B now that they're home or wherever they are at point B that there's additional goals now that needs to be addressed to keep them at point B and sometimes it's not recognized and so so oftentimes the patient's engagement is not recognizing those issues and the priorities that some patients might have and their families might have that they're not similar to your priorities or it's very short-sighted, for example. So um, this one place says we're a CBO. We want to know who pays for this. We operate outside our scope all the time. For example, a client living alone has maybe first grade reading level and has paid a caregiver whose first language is not English, how are they to engage in this model? I would say in terms of the payment structures, 
that's going to vary from place to place, but there have been community-based organizations that have been able to successfully set up formal partnerships for payment um, with healthcare entities, whether that's a managed care organization or a hospital system or a particular clinical system of care. And so that's going to be really dependent on the area, but if you want to chat more, I would be happy to chat um, offline. And I will turn it over to Dr. Ong for the patient engagement part. Okay, so um, Jeanette said, just for clarification, one Medicare requirement for home health by Medicare requires a patient to have a face-to-face -face visit with an MD within 90 days before home health can begin, and then again 30 days after home health has begun. And this can also become a barrier for quick home health services. And they're nodding agreement. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then from your site, <laughs> Melissa, oh, okay. what are the barriers to having home care and AAA referrals? Home care seems appropriate for patients, but often there was not a referral. It's best for the AAAs, um, TCS, and home care to work together to cover all the bases. I think that what she's trying to say is that sometimes the home care referral maybe wasn't necessarily made from the hospital setting, but once we've been in the home, we see that opportunity. Like this person could really benefit from having us here trying to leverage community resources and set up systems for day 31 or day 331. Um, and so working together to do that communication back to the primary care to say, you know, there might be an opportunity for home health here. How can we make this? happen and this is what we're working on also. So, so keeping in touch with primary care even exactly, about future throughout, plans. throughout the process and mm -hmm. communicating that back because the hospital team may have not have had any idea what that home environment was going to look like or even how that person was going to function on day eight. And so Dr. Ong, how would you kind of manage that sort of connection transition discussion? Yeah, I think that that's a definite challenge that um, the audience member picked up on and, and many clinicians struggle with, is that oftentimes we practice within a siloed setting and not communicating those issues. I think that as our healthcare system is slowly moving to a more bundled value-based purchasing where we're talking about the value of our care, hopefully that this issue that you're bringing up becomes less and less of an issue. Um, and that's a regulatory requirement in terms of paying for, for that service. But I think that that's where um, the community-based organizations definitely are critical in that patient in transitioning that person home. I think that, that um, there are care systems out there that having a uh, mobile practice um, and having a mobile practice is becoming more and more common. Delivering care to that person, to that patient at the time that they need it and also at the location that they're at. And with our healthcare expanding into telemedicine, hopefully that these are um, interventions particularly for rural parts of our state and our nation that we can reach. And okay, I think the so VA does, does a decent question. job. Oh, yeah, ahead. and it was just saying that the VA does a decent job um, of reaching out. How can we do transitions of care with homeless population? So that's definitely a challenge. I know within our system, we that's not an exclusion. And we'll meet patients in a variety of settings depending on the program. I know that we have care coordinators who work diligently to find their homeless patients that they're working with, so meeting with them at their tent potentially. We have met with patients at a clinic setting, so before or after a doctor's visit, so where, wherever we can meet up with them in a place where they feel safe talking about these issues or talking about their health care. Um, so for us, that's not necessarily a factor that disqualifies someone from accessing the program. Um, one thing to add to that is just a challenge for us is really reaching a person post-transition if they're homeless, um, because even if they've been given materials after discharge, you know, that's not really a priority of them of maintaining that and making that phone call themselves after. And so where's 
where, how do you find someone and then engage with them? Um, and, you know, I don't have necessarily the answers to that right now, but that's definitely a challenge we have. But I wonder, you know, if it's possible or if any health systems are, you know, providing prepaid cell phones or cell phone cards, uh, you mm -hmm. know, as a way that, you know, this person can kind of remain connected to services. Yeah, you know, I think that it, each clinician can probably come up with certain um, cases and patients that you worked with that poses a significant challenge for um, providing good transitional care. Um, and these individuals who are homeless poses a significant challenge to that because of just the social determinants of health um, related to that. And, you know, just thinking of, of the majority of people, 60% of people who have a home and have good support we're still not doing a good job on those individuals yet. Um, and so I think that, that there's a huge population um, that we're missing out on as well, that we're not even doing a good job and they have adequate resources. But, but I think it does hi highlight the point that providing good transitional care um, is a wraparound, that the, taking people in terms of a comprehensive approach in terms of what their fu functional physical, social abilities are. Um, so would you agree that Medicare consumers do not know about the 30-day readmission rule? I don't know if they don't know about that. Um, if they don't, I think that it was soon um, many um, consumers will know because it will be a quality metric, very similar to the five-star rating that some of the clinicians might be familiar with for nursing homes. It's a quality metric that many hospitals will uh, be published upon. And so it will be known uh, as a quality metric. And then I'm not sure where conditions. this is at, but um, a program is uh, identified called Health Home Program which is working to close the gaps on transitions with homeless patients. Do you know of that program? So that's, yeah, so that's a statewide initiative here in Washington State where it is leveraging Affordable Care Act dollars to meet the needs of that, the highest utilizer population. So there's all sorts of algorithms behind the scenes on how someone qualifies, and it's based off claims. Um, but it is putting a person in place who's meant to be that central care coordinator, um, and they definitely engage with and work with people experiencing homelessness. And care transitions or transitions of care is an essential component of, that of the Health Homes Initiative, meaning that they have a mandate to see patients face-to-face -face within a certain amount of time of a hospitalization for any patients that are on their caseload. Gotcha. Is there an income eligibility for that then? It's not income based. They have to be receiving Medicaid health insurance benefits mm -hmm. and they can be dual eligible. I see. All right. I think that's all the questions that we have time for. So thank you. You're getting yeah, lots of kudos. You. Uh, oh, by the thank chat. you. Thank you.